Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Victor Haberstadt. I'm the chairman of this session on Eurasia. Uh, on Actually, it's called uh, uh, Region in Transformation. Uh, this very uh, distinguished panel, uh, and very competent panel, uh, President of uh, Azerbaijan, Minister of, uh, of Kazakhstan, former President of the European Commission, President of the EBRD, uh, and one of the great private sector players in the region, uh, Mr. Deripaska. Um, we will, uh, this is a uh, session which is on the record, uh, and we will have uh, an opportunity for Q&A in the, well, I would so call the third half of the session, but we will initially have a, uh, introductory remarks by President Aliyev, your comments, uh, and then we have initial comments from each of the panelists, then we'll go for a Q&A. So, President Aliyev, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, talking about transformation in the region, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, we should start from the very beginning, when we became independent back in 1991. That was a major transformation for the region, and also a biggest challenge for us, because we got an opportunity to build an independent state, and we had um, to build a state at the same time to build a modern economy based on market economy principles. So the transformation for us was a transformation of political system, because before independence we didn't have any, and transformation from planned economy to market economy. And I think that these 23 years of independence are remarkable from point of view of what a country can achieve if it has a op policy of open doors, attracts investments, and addresses the main challenges um, of um, today. So, from economic point of view, Azerbaijan's economy now is 85% is uh, uh, private sector. Also, the policy of diversification of economy is uh, successfully implemented. We are more and more um, free from the pressure of the oil prices. So, biggest part of our economy is in, uh, generated in non-energy sector. At the same time, a lot has been done in implementing the major infrastructure projects with the assistance of international financial institutions, particularly EBRD and others. And now Azerbaijan already became a donor country, so we are already ourselves finance uh, several projects through IFC and other international financial instruments. Of course, energy security for us in the beginning was a means to develop because that was the main energy resources we had. Now our energy uh, resources play a role in the region. And just recently we launched a new major mega project which is called Southern Gas Corridor to transport gas from Azerbaijan to Europe, which will uh, be uh, probably the biggest, one of the biggest infrastructure projects of Europe. And the uh, Southern Gas Corridor is already a project uh, which is uh, being implemented. Diversification of economy is one of the important elements for every country, especially rich with oil and gas. And here I think we also can talk about some success. But of course, a lot is to be done in the future because uh, we are living in the region which is transforming not only from uh, negative to positive, but unfortunately, we have some uh, deterioration in the region. We have more and more conflicts, more and more threats, including uh, threats of um, terroristic attacks. And uh, of course, uh, stability inside the country can be provided fully when you have more or less predictable situation beyond your borders. Therefore, our energy and transportation projects are aimed at a broad international or regional cooperation so that every country can benefit. And I think that the policy which our government is pursuing that everybody should take advantage of um, our opportunities, producers, transitors, consumers. So it's a kind of a teamwork which Azerbaijan managed to create. And today, the region where we are situated is more stable than ever before. But uh, beyond our borders of the region, situation is changing. So the new challenges, uh, of course, uh, the um, drop of the oil price is a challenge for our economy. But uh, I think we always need to find positive moments, even if something negative is happening. So it will mobilize us to be more efficient, to spend less, 
and to learn to live with uh, low oil prices. That will be very useful for us when our resources will come to an end. Probably I will conclude now in order to be on the, on the track. Thank you for being so disciplined and I'm sure it's a great a model and a great example for the other panelists. But could you elaborate perhaps for a few more minutes on the geopolitical constraints which you were implicitly referring to? Well, for us, of course, uh, the main <coughs> challenge is a conflict resolution because we are suffering from the occupation by Armenia for more than 20 years. And uh, for more than 20 years, the negotiation process does not lead to any result. And I think that uh, all the conflicts in the post-Soviet area and in general in the world must be treated from the same angle, the same approach, and the same international law norms must be applied. Uh, when one conflict is not resolved or is protracted, then it leads the uh, way to other conflicts. Therefore, what we see now in the post-Soviet area is very disappointing. And not only we see tensions in the Middle East, we see uh, since I've been here last time, a lot has been changed. We have new threats which we could not even imagine that we will have. And these threats are no longer regional threats, they're global threats. And we see these terrible attacks uh, in Europe which were generated by destabilization and maybe by uh, not addressing uh, the right time the issues which uh, seem to be local or regional. Uh, of course, our conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan is a regional conflict, but it has an impact on a broader scale from point of view of geography and from point of view of methodology. If you don't address and re resolve this conflict based on international law, then you must be ready to, to see the similar things in other parts of the world. And also important is that international law norms should not be interpreted by different countries uh, with respect to their interests. They must be interpreted as they've been written. And it's a very clear definition in the United Nations Charter in documents of OEC and other international organizations about priorities of the principles of international law. So all of them must be observed. Then we will avoid uh, double standards and more important, we will avoid or maybe reduce the risks of uh, new conflicts in our region. Thank you. Um, Minister, um, you are in charge of integration and trade for Kazakhstan play a crucial role in this context which has been painted by, uh, by the President. Could you comment on where you see the threats, not only the opportunities? First, I'll start with opportunities. And, I, I uh, thought so. Uh, I think that uh, in any challenges, uh, be that a global challenge or regional challenge, one should look for uh, the best ways of uh, addressing these challenges. And uh, the way how Kazakhstan is approaching uh, in addressing these challenges is uh, its openness, openness of its economy, as well as openness of its uh, p uh, political system for political cooperation with the neighboring countries in the region as well as globally. So I just would like to start uh, having here President Barroso that last year in the Davos meeting, my president met with President Barroso and they agreed that uh, they will be, by the end of 2014, uh, concluding, uh, Kazakhstan and the European Union will be concluding enhanced partnership and cooperation framework yeah. agreement. Uh, European Union, 28 member states of the European Union are our largest trading partner. More than 50% of our trade takes place with EU member states and uh, more than half of our foreign direct investments, which exceed $200 billion since we gained independence, uh, has been attracted from European Union member states. So uh, we, I just would like uh, to state, uh, I'm pleased to state that, that I arrived from Brussels yesterday where we initialed this document, uh, Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation Framework with European Union, which will be leading to more, to better investment climate uh, and uh, as well as to increasing the trade with European uh, countries. As you know, also Kazakhstan is participating in the customs union with our regional neighbors, Russia and Belarus, and which has been transformed as of 1st January 2015 into the Eurasian Economic Union where we have freedom of uh, movement of goods, freedom move of movement of labor and capital between these three countries. And uh, all these uh, efforts 
regional and global integration efforts mm. are being undertaken with the sole purpose of diversification of Kazakhstan's economy and uh, uh, creating better uh, favorable investment climate for investments into non-mining, non-extracting and non-oil and gas sectors because Kazakhstan was successful in attracting investments into in oil and gas sectors, as well as uh, Azerbaijan. And the major challenge, as President Aliyev has mentioned, is a diversification of the national economy and the creation of better investment climate. So this is a uh, approach. This is a, a position of Kazakhstan in addressing the regional challenges which we do have in the region. And we have uh, a strong relationship with all former Soviet republics. We have a CIS free trade agreement, and we are committed to maintaining this free trade and further enhancing uh, our uh, free trade and strong economic cooperation with uh, uh, neighboring countries in the region. Thank you. So let me follow up on that uh, uh, encouraging statement, but the geopolitical threats which were uh, briefly described by the president, do you see them similarly? Of course, uh, geopolitical uh, threats which are happening in the region, they have implications in the form of uh, decreased, uh, decreased, reduced oil prices, sharp decline in oil price, and as well as uh, uh, hesitance on the part of in foreign direct investors. And uh, this type of uh, implications we are facing. But uh, we can't say that we are being directly affected by the uh, geopolitical threats uh, or regional threats. But of course, our relationship and our cooperation with these, member, uh, with these countries are uh, being reduced or being negatively affected. And we are working with these governments in order to address them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharibata. You have been involved heavily, and EBRD is, in the region. Uh, can you give us a quick uh, overview of uh, what you see as the facts and the threats and opportunities? Okay. Well, maybe um, I'd walk to start, really, where President Aliyev started. Because I think it's quite important, a history lesson, really, to remember. In 1991, these were new countries, many of these countries. And what has happened, I think, in the last nearly a quarter of a century now, has been quite extraordinary. And people tend to forget that. People tend to sort of look at just the last six months last year and focus on that. But actually, there's been enormous progress. And I think the biggest issue now is how to maintain that progress. Of course, in the first decade uh, after 91, there was a lot of reform. A lot of what we call the low-hanging fruit type reform was done and highly necessary. But we need EBRD, as you probably saw in this uh, famous Stuck in Transition report, back in 2013, we said basically the region, not just Eurasia, but also Eastern Europe as well, had got rather stuck. Transition uh, reforms were not progressing because they were much more difficult. They really required the taking on of vested interests, and actually that was much more difficult for any politician in any country, not just in Eurasia. So I'm very pleased, actually, because I think in what's happened in the last 12 months, and particularly in these two countries, is a signal of actually uh, reform, again, being regenerated in some of these countries. We need more of it, of course, but I think that's been very good. I'd say the, the key areas, um, and we very, I'm very interested in here, what Oleg says as well, as a businessman, but from where we sit as an institution that does a lot of project finance and tries to push reform, transition reform, I think there are three or four areas, really. One would be that uh, there's less cross-border uh, capital flow frankly, into this region than there should be. Uh, and that's uh, partly because a lot of country, a lot of institutions don't know the region very well, actually. There's a lack of knowledge and information about the region. It's quite extraordinary quite often. Uh, I think also the tighter regulations have made it much harder, actually, for an, an unknown region, globally at least, to attract money. So that means the Eurasian countries have to work twice as hard, mm -hmm. I often feel, to attract uh, finance. Uh, that's very, very important. Outside of the natural resources sector, of course, that's well known. Secondly, I think, uh, what, what do businessmen look for? Um, they look for stable and predictable business environments. Uh, they want as liberal a climate as they can get, but they're really looking for a stable and uh, consistent climate. Uh, and I think that's important. They want to look for a functioning, well-functioning judiciary, particularly the commercial courts need to function well, uh, um, the procurement processes, those are things that 
businesses would look for. And I think that's very important. That's a challenge that we're trying to work on together. Another area would be sort of the resilience uh, area. Uh, what we said in that famous report in 2013 was uh, to attract investment, to get cross-border trade going, one needs very strong and sound political and economic institutions, good governance uh, by, any, uh, by old language, if you like. And I think that goes beyond just the usual institutions of an uh, independent central bank, good functioning Ministry of Finance. Of course, we need all those things too. But we also need to build up local capital markets, local uh, sources of finance too, to help uh, the economies be resilient in times when it's difficult to attract foreign investment particularly. I think that's very, very important. And I know in both countries, and I've certainly discussed it with the President, I've discussed it with President Nazarbayev, the importance of transparency, really seriously fighting corruption where everyone sees it. And, you, and that's an important issue to bring out, I think, as well. The last point I think I, I, I ought to make is really about connectivity, as I'd put it. Um, I think it's great that in, in these two countries we have leaderships which are trying to connect with international institutions, not just mine, many others. I think this is very important, it's the exchange of ideas, the setting of standards, the regulatory frameworks. This is how uh, this gets done. I think it's extremely important. The thing that uh, still concerns me, particularly in Central Asia, is uh, the, I suppose, less than optimal, suboptimal connectivity between the countries. Uh, the number of times when I go to the region and I hear about problems at the border, customs issues and so on, this is impeding trade, uh, making it difficult for businessmen. I think, and businesswomen to really do the business. So I think a lot more work needs to be done within the region to try and break down some of the, the boundaries. Sometimes it is about conflict issues, which of course you, you raise. I, I think one can't deny that. However, there are conflicts in the, in the region. I would say, as, on the whole, one of the marketing devices that this region hasn't used enough of, in my view, is that it is actually more of an oasis of stability and peace, certainly Central Asia, than some other parts of the world. Uh, and that's what I tend to say to foreign investors. So I'm going to India in two weeks' time. What will I be saying to them? Come to Central Asia, particularly, because actually you have a, a much more stable environment there as well, politically. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pasca, you, are, you represent the private sector in this, uh, in this conversation, and uh, you are very active in the region. So. Uh, I, I know you are uh, very enthusiastic about the opportunities, but tell us about the, uh, the issues which you think uh, need to be addressed. As a result of opportunities, but it's a tough time in front of us. And uh, commodity slump, it's not just oil, it's the rest of commodities. And of course, a driver of, of our region in the past was uh, resources. But anyway, we, I think we just need to be prepared for next cycle. The cycle wouldn't take long and uh, I would really you know focus on infrastructure because infrastructure is really what's unite Eurasia whatever program would be you know Shanghai cooperation one Europe from uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok you know we never talk you know about India but India it's Eurasian you know, country you know, and we have technology now to connect India you know, by railway by roads and it on the way it will helps you know, to resolve a lot of issues you know, with security. You know. And I think log logistic, transport infrastructure, communication is the key. And no one could do it alone. Yes, Soviet Union was strong enough. It's developed a lot of infrastructure, a lot of benefits you know, we, we inherited. You know, China, very focused. But China focused in you know, China-centric. All pipelines law goes in China. All in you know, ways, you know, even if it's Silk Road, you know, it helps a lot. You know, for all of us, you know, but this, and I think somehow governments, you know, bodies, you know, must design, and it's much more, you know, should be much more tougher institutions than just a think tank, you know, it should be planning agency. And we all, you know, been about, you know, planning economy for quite a long time, and it was a good, you know, benefit, you know, from this planning economy, especially for infrastructure, you can't miss. If you miss, you know, and if you not understand what's the flow of the cargo, you know, then your port wouldn't be utilized and you invest a lot. And a lot of projects started, you know, Silk Roads, I mentioned. You know, Russia developed, um, you know, Trans-Siberian Roads at BAM, you know. You know we started this, you know, together with Asian partners, this uh, polar way, you know, which save, you know, almost 12 days if you, if you travel, you know. You know, air, you know, in a, 
uh, airplanes, you know, now, you know, not just east to west, you know, west to east, but also cross, you know, cross polar, you know, traffic. And, but all this infrastructure might, must be supported, you know, from the state. We, we can do a lot, you know, but if it would be, you know, state, you know, com states, not just one state, state's commitment, you know, and it would be proper dedication of resources and, I think it's it's a key issue. You know, I'll talk. You know, we already benefit a lot from com communication infrastructure. It's really one you know in a digital platform now in Asia. You know, in a sense, you know, got, we have this developed. You know, but uh, infrastructure will demand more resources, and our countries, unfortunately, you know, will have the slump. You know, because of uh, you know commodity price you know, collapse. And it's not for one year, two years. It would be much more longer, you know, for, for many you know, reasons, you know, but the infrastructure must you know must be still on focus. Same British when they build their empire and use their revolution, they secure their traffic you know, through, through the sea. America when they try to develop they build this railway roads and then they use airplanes, you know, and uh, Eurasia has no other option. We need to build common infrastructure and this should be well sought and prepared. In advance and should be a proper planning agency for this. Would it make a difference if the Eurasian Economic Union would take off as an institution? We'll be very weak, to be honest. You know, Russia would be very weak, and it's not our cycle. You know, but we could not postpone development for the next seven years. You know. mm -hmm. When you wake up and oil will be back, you know, hundred twenty dollars. You know, you know, or we would need, you know, more iron ore or coal. You know, all these resources. You know, it would be very expensive. You know, we, if we talk about growth, you know, we need to talk about sustainable growth. And you need to think about inf infrastructure now, not in 25 years. And, and Eurasia is the most populated continent, you know, and we don't know, you know, you know how, how far we can go. And, and the more security will bring, you know, more prosperity, more stability, more kids. And, you know, infrastructure is an important you know, issue. And if you not, you know, put this, even now, you know, it would be much more cheaper. Mm -hmm. Even now, you know, things, you know, you know, Ambitions would be lower because of low oil price. You know, it would be you know, you know more more easy to negotiate between the countries, and it brings security. Thank you, President Barroso. You've been uh, in in the many dossiers you have been dealing with in the past uh, decade. You've been very busy with this one too. Yeah. It was already referred to by the minister. Uh, so, how do you compare this now to say? five years ago when you and I, I believe, first spoke about this. Fine. First of all, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, in fact, we have made a priority uh, this region, the Eurasian region, and specifically these two countries represented here by President Aliyev and also by Minister Aitzanova, so Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. We are, the European Union is by, by, a, la by a large difference the biggest uh, economic partner, and that's very important. Mm -hmm in trade and investment by a huge difference with other very important players that are neighbors. Of course, Russia is a very important player, comes second. China, even to a less extent, is present, but it's increasing precisely. This uh, Silk Road project is a project that <coughs> China gives the highest importance. So I believe it's critically important for Europe, uh, the, um, the development of this region. So, Eurasia is key for Europe stability and security. That's why we have been supporting all the moves for diversification of energy supplies. I had the honor in January 2011 to sign with President Aliyev precise declaration that created this possibility of this Southern uh, Corridor. And I was so proud that, in fact, one of the last moments of my presidency was receiving President Nazarbayev in, in Brussels to uh, give the final political agreement on this uh, cooperation, uh, per enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement. So it's critically important for Europe for these reasons, not only for energy, but energy is certainly a part, and because it is a strategic link between Europe and Asia. Yeah. And because also, if we don't solve some of these conflicts that are in the region, and now I'm going to be less diplomatic than those who are in office. Now I'm free for public office. <laughs> there are real problems there. Uh, we have not mentioned, but these two countries are countries that are predominantly Muslim. But they are secular countries. And, but this uh, ISIS, they have made one of their uh, goals is to establish a caliphate in uh, Central Asia. 
So it's critically important the success of these countries to establish themselves as a barrier against all forms of Muslim fundamentalism and terrorism. This is a major geopolitical threat that we have uh, for or Europe, and now Europe I'm speaking in general, including uh, Russia, by the way. It's a major, major threat. But also, let's be honest about this, not everything that, uh, that has been developing last years in the so-called post-Soviet space has been in the right direction. And uh, um, one of the major challenges here, here is to support the consolidation of the independence and sovereignty of these countries. Uh, President Adiyev said these are very re relatively young countries. So the first task they had was to consolidate as states. And what they have done is impressive, as a, a our friend, the President of the EBRD just said. They have not only consolidated their independence, their statehood, but in terms of economic development, it's great. Now, the challenge for those countries, as I see it, I'm giving, of course, an outside perspective. Correct me if I'm wrong. But as I see, now the task is the reforms, the modernization of the countries, both economically and politically, at the same time that this sovereignty, this statehood is consolidated. That's why, for instance, we are very supportive of the European uh, Union. I'm sp still speaking, even if I'm no longer in an official capacity, but that's what I think. Supportive of all these uh, moves, for instance, to join the WTO. Uh, just now we were present in a, a commemoration of a signature of a program between the Kazakhstan and, and uh, the OECD. So everything that can help the reform, stabilization uh, uh, in the long run and um, stability of those countries. Because there are indeed geopolitical challenges uh, where the position occupied by Kazakhstan and by um, Azerbaijan can be uh, crucial. Namely, the stability or lack of stability in the relationship in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the, the relation with the post-Soviet space, this is key, and also, of course, the uh, threat of uh, all forms of terrorism, including this, I mean, I, I don't like to use the word Muslim, but I'm sorry, they, they say, they are Muslim, the, the, the Muslim fundamentalist terrorist threat that we have seen uh, recently also with this very imp important impact in, in Europe. So I personally believe that this problem, the, uh, the fall of the prices of oil, can really be, I know it's a common place to say it's an opportunity, but I really believe it can be. It's a blessing for you. Your country has now the possibility to diversify. As President Donaldi have said, to be, not to become lazy. To use the resources that you have, and you have considerable, uh, impressive resources, to diversify in all sectors, because we know that uh, uh, constraints are the greatest trigger for, for reform. And so I believe now the speed of reform in your countries and diversification is going to be bigger. But the other point, and I want to fully con concur with our friend from the BRD, the integration in the region is not sufficient. Uh, within the region itself, and I'm not speaking not only of these two countries. For instance, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, there are problems, there are problems with water. We know that sometimes there are difficult problems. Of course, we have the problems not solved like the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. But the integration in the region is not sufficient. <coughs> we in the European Union, by definition, we support European, uh, we support regional integration. And that's an important debate, but that should be another panel probably. Why can't we do it with the Eurasian Union? Because for us, we, we want to do it. At least I want to tell you, my leadership in the Commission, and I'm sure the new one as well, wants an Eurasian Union to be uh, stable and to have a good relationship. The fact that we have finalized an agreement with Kazakhstan, being Kazakhstan a member of the Customs Union, <coughs> is a good expression of that. But one, that's a very important thing. We believe in open regionalism. When you create a new union, a regional union, it is not too close to others, on the contrary. It's not to, ra to raise new obstacles to trade, it's to lower tariffs, it's to uh, reduce uh, non-tariff barriers. And this is the important question. It seems a nuance, but it's very important. Can we one day have this dream? I spoke several times with President Putin about that. From Lisbon to Vladivostok, can it happen? I believe it can happen. But it is not creating opposing uh, unions, original unions, it is creating, if necessary, unions or subunions, but they are open to the others and that they are able to establish um, a good, uh, deep, deep relations. So what is going to happen in these two countries in the next years? 
is critically important, I believe, for stability, not only in Europe, in the broader Euro-Asian region, including Russia, and also in the relations with other important players that uh, we have not mentioned all of them, like Iran. It's an important player also in the, close to this region. And also, someone mentioned also India. So how can we be sure that this region is not become a real problem for the world? On the contrary, can be a good example for a prosperity, stability, and of course, um, justice in the region and in the world. President, when we started this conversation, I think two and a half years ago in Baku, mm -hmm. when we had this, uh, you and I are the only ones in this group uh, 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 who, who were involved at that, um, what has changed? I mean, obviously, there's a much greater acceptance of the great opportunities. But the threats which Jose Manuel Barroso was referring to are, have come on stage. So how do you perceive that? Um, for the, uh, for the success of uh, what you're trying to achieve. Yes, exactly. I fully agree with what President Barroso said uh, in his uh, remarks. Uh, very, you know, um, knowledgeable. You know, it's a result of his great experience and knowledge. And also he knows very well the region and um, really understands the challenges of the region. And what uh, countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and our neighbors uh, want to see for, for the future. We, all of us, we want to have stable, peaceful development in our country so people live better, have good access to decent you know, services, to be more protected, to, to live in a safe situation. And those threats which um, today became very obvious, these threats, potential threats, always existed. It was just a matter how countries address these potential threats. What do they do in order to prevent it? Because when the threat is, is obvious and all, already attacks you, it's already late. You need to work hard in order to uh, you know, create such an atmosphere in the society, first of all, in your own country, so that this, the grounds for these threats would be minimum. And that is mainly economic development, reduction of unemployment, poverty, and good governance, and social justice. So these were the key elements uh, which uh, for us was always a main priority. And when we started economic reforms, and it was not easy because, as I said before, we had to change the system completely when we were very in a very poor situation. At that time, we didn't have uh, oil and gas development, and uh, the poverty was, you know, endemic. So uh, changing this uh, economic system created a lot of social tensions. So therefore, for us, social policy, economic policy, always was going, you know, in parallel because uh, radical economic reforms lead to sometimes uh, social problems. And the threats uh, which today became obvious like terrorist threats, like what is happening in the Middle East, that's mainly because of uh, uh, lack of education. So we invested a lot in education. And one of my first uh, public addresses was as a president uh, 10 years ago. I said, we need to transform black gold into human capital. In other, in other words, to use advantages of energy resources that, to invest in education, invest in modern technologies, invest in services. And that's why today Azerbaijan is a country with space industry. And we are proud to have now two satellites. We have 100% literacy. And um, you have now a middle class which uh, generates wealth regardless of the, the oil price. Radicalism is, of course, is a, a a threat to all of us. And as President Barroso correctly mentioned, geopolitical location of uh, our countries is a natural barrier for radicals to penetrate to European continent. In other words, uh, security and stability in Azerbaijan <coughs> and Kazakhstan is not only for our countries, but for neighborhood. And importance of our countries for Europe is not only measured by oil and gas, as somebody uh, usually thinks. So it's very important and maybe more than ever before. But also it's a good example of secular modern Muslim countries. And it shows that it is possible in a Muslim country to have modern society, secular society, with all respect to all the traditional religions, to build a society which you know, is based on uh, common values. And our uh, initiatives, which were also supported by European Commission, to become closer 
to EU mainly has this agenda. I remember at one of the press conferences with President Barroso, I said, uh, we want to be as close to the European Union as possible. And I want to repeat it. And for us, it's not only access to market and uh, technology, but also it's a kind of a guarantee that our modern secular development will continue. So uh, at the same time, it's also very important uh, making assessment about our region, of course, about the history. Our countries were not independent for centuries. And this is a kind of a psychological background. Therefore, independence, how majority of population understand it, is uh, always accompanied by uh, you know, national dignity. So now we are free. Now we have our own flag. We are members of the United Nations. Now we show that we can live ourselves, and we want to do it ourselves. Sometimes it creates certain uh, you know, movements when we're addressing the issues which are mainly referring to political development and political reforms. But we are committed to do it. And uh, as President Barroso said, political reforms are very important because without that, no country can have a sustainable development. We want to have the same situation and system in Azerbaijan as in the developed countries of the world. And if you look at the developed countries of the world, you'll see that none of them has oil or gas. And those who have oil and gas sometimes do not have the full benefits of uh, these resources. So oil and gas is a, just a means for development. And of course, uh, issues like security and we're playing role, for instance, on security in the region, Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Deripaska was referring to infrastructure. We are building the railroad connection between uh, the regions, uh, so-called bakut Bilisi cars Railroad, which will connect the continents. Everybody will benefit. Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Georgia, Europe. And this is a win-win project. So we need to do more projects like that. But the only thing is, uh, the agenda of the governments with the low oil price, the governments which used to have you know, a lot of cash, how they will plan their budget. I agree, we need to invest more into infrastructure, but with this oil price, we invest more in infrastructure, our reserves go down. And we need to find a proper balance because the reserves, they create confidence, not only inside the country, but for investors. When we are reducing our reserves for the sake of major infrastructure, that could have also some negative impact. So the right balance must be found. Right, thank you, President. Uh, now, I think we should now turn to, to the audience. We have uh, like 15 minutes for very brief questions and, uh, and comments, but I underline brief, preferably, and those who want to speak, please identify yourself. Uh, who has a question? You must have been extraordinary convincing, all <laughs> five of you, huh? from all the people I know in the room. The last thing I'd expected that it would all be mum. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's intriguing. So uh, let's go back to that. Uh, I have one. Oh, there, there is one. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, speaking of Pisarski, I'm Tremor of Pulaski Foundation uh, from Poland. Uh, my question is. Uh, how the relation between Russia and Ukraine uh, influences the relation between Russia and former Soviet states? Just uh, the current state of situation and development. Thank you very much. So I should probably first ask Mr. Derry Poska. Uh, this is development, recent development, of course, it's a, it's a tragedy. You have to understand that 40% of Russian has relatives in Ukraine. 17%, 70% of Ukrainian has relatives in Russia. It wouldn't take long and uh, there is different, uh, how to say, reason why it started, why it was developed. It was not well thought through, you know, you know for the last two years, you know, from the, from the any side. There would be more casualties. You know. There would be definitely fight for another three, four months. And, uh, but as, as I said, it's a tragedy. By sufferings will come wisdom. I don't know what would happen, but uh, you know, I I believe that there is more opportunity to restore trust. 
you know, I believe that if we will work together, it was, you know, it was the right point. You know, yes, we will be, you know, less, uh, how to say, we'll have less opportunity to invest ourselves, but we will give opportunity to our European partners, you know, partners in China to use cheap resources, and they need things through, you know, for the quite uh, longer term, you know, and they need energy. You know. You know, energy resources, you know, and if energy will not be used efficiently, like we see in, the, uh, in China, you know, then pollution will damage the rest, the rest of the world. That's why, you know, we need to you know, join forces. And uh, infrastructure is the first step. And what's happened between our two brothers' countries? It's, as I said, it's a tragedy, and uh, we just need to live through and wait three, four years to heal it. Do you see light at the end of that road? Currently? Of course, there is no chance. There was no Slavic war which bring any pride to anyone for the last thousand years. Right. Uh, ten seconds of silence. Pres President, I'm mm -hmm. hearing Mr. Deripaska. So what is the impact of the Russia-Ukraine uh, from a practical point of view, uh, in Azerbaijan, nobody feels any impact on that. I want to be very open and frank. So it does not impact on us on the day-to-day -day, uh, format. But of course, from a political point of view, uh, for any country which has good friendly relations with Russia and Ukraine, it's not a, a situation which... Uh, uh, which is preferable. And of course, we share the pain of the people who lost their relatives, and its tragedy unfortunately continues. Innocent people are being killed from uh, both sides, and of course, the sooner this uh, comes to an end, the better. We as a country which suffered from war and occupation, uh, we understand it, and uh, every war ends uh, with ceasefire, and then preferably uh, the peace agreement must be signed. And also, I think important is um, how the governments of Russia and Ukraine uh, treat uh, their partners and uh, what is the level of understanding in the governments of these countries to the position of their partners. Because we are all members of community of independent states. We have uh, been all members of Soviet Union. We have a lot of connections. Of course, not as Russians as Uk and Ukrainians, but. We also have relatives in Russia, in Ukraine. We have maybe more than one million Azerbaijanis living in Russia and more than 500,000 in Ukraine. And they are, uh, for instance, on both sides. And it's just like, a, like a civil confrontation. But what I'm saying is that, um, and I think there is, there is understanding, because uh, Azerbaijan's position on territorial integrity is very clear and straightforward. And no one can expect any other position from Azerbaijan having in mind international law norms and our situation with Armenia. And I'm glad that the Russian government and the leadership understands that this is a position which Azerbaijan has, and they respect this position. And we discussed it on the high level of, with uh, my colleagues in Russia. The same, I hope, is the situation uh, with the Ukrainian government. We didn't have a chance to have a contact, but I think they also should understand that for us, Russia is a good friend a good partner, reliable partner, big neighbor. We have a lot of uh, contacts. We have a lot of trade, mutual interests. And uh, the way how relations between Russia and Azerbaijan develop is a good indicator on how relations between, uh, you know, uh, big country and small country being neighbors can be uh, managed. And I think a very good indicator. So it depends mainly on... Uh, on the understanding in both capitals, in Moscow and Kiev, that countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and some others of, uh, of the neighborhood, they have their own agenda, their own position. They don't want to damage relations with neither of them. And they want sincerely the soonest resolution of this conflict because of victims, first of all, because of tragedy, and because of this situation is not comfortable. You know, we want to be in a comfortable situation dealing with our two friends. So I hope, as Mr. Diribaska says, uh, soon we'll have <laughs> ceasefire as a first step, and then agreements. Mr. Shakrabarty. Well, I think yeah. my two uh, colleagues have summed it up. The word tragedy is about the right word, I think. Um, it's an economic and social tragedy. 
that's going on here. Um, I think uh, if you look at just Ukraine and Russia alone, it's a tragedy. Uh, but if you look at the neighboring region, the collateral damage is enormous, actually. We've just published our new forecast this week, economic forecast for these countries. We're predicting that both Russia and Ukraine will both contract by 5% of GDP uh, this year. It's a huge contraction yeah. in both. If you look at even Central Asia, and I'm not including Azerbaijan in these numbers, uh, the average is going to go down from 6.6 to 3.6%. Uh, percent, you know, it's it's not it's not nowhere near the economic potential growth rate of these countries, and that is because of the damage. Because the Russian economy is such a powerful motor for the region, <coughs> remittances, export markets, and so on, it's having enormous damage. So, uh, like uh, Oleg, like President Aliyev, I of course hope that uh, leaderships will come to their senses, be able to talk, and find a way through this. Uh, but it is really, really seriously awful. And in the case of Ukraine, I think they're on the brink here of economic catastrophe unless uh, a huge reform program is enacted, unless there's a huge IMF-led package as well, uh, and we can get good businessmen to come back into Ukraine and invest again. And, of course, we're trying to do our bit there, but it's a bit difficult. It does, though, I think, if, with oil as well on top of that, not just sanctions, but oil on top of that at $50 a barrel, it does um, push, I think, uh, countries to really push for diversification. We keep talking about diversification. Another EBRD study back in 2012 uh, showed that Russia was less diversified now, is less diversified now than it was in Soviet times, both in sectoral terms, but also in regional spatial terms as well. Uh, so there's something to be said for central planning. Um, that's uh, it's an extraordinary outcome. Who would have thought as Russia became more of an open market economy that would happen? But a lot of policy changes have been delayed because oil was at such a high price. So if there's one thing that we should do now is really take diversification seriously. And here, again, both Azerbaijan and uh, Kazakhstan have started implementing policies. I think the non-oil and gas sector has actually taken a larger share of uh, GDP in both countries. That's good. But a lot more change in that direction is required to make them more resilient. Thank you. Ricardo House, one back. Thank you. Um, um, continuing on the, on the question indirectly of, of Ukraine, um, Russia has moved on the agenda of the Eurasian common market to which Kazakhstan has, has joined uh, together with Belarus. Um, obviously, um, the implications of Russia confronting the West means that the ruble took a hit uh, sanction, commercial sanctions were put in. Um, that complicates the relationship for Kazakhstan. So I have like two questions. First, uh, is the value of the Eurasian common market lower for Kazakhstan because of Russian confrontation with Europe? And a question for Russia, is confrontation with Europe a negative for its ability to recreate a Eurasian common market because it's less attractive to join a country uh, that has very unstable financial and trade relations with the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, maybe, Pastor. yes, mm -hmm. okay. the question about Kazakhstan. Yes. Um, Kazakhstan is a landlocked country. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, our largest trading partner for our exports uh, as well as for imports for trade is European Union, followed by Russia, China, and uh, other countries. So uh, Ukraine is the second largest partner, economic partner for Kazakhstan in the CIS region. And uh, for Kazakhstan, always is, uh, the issue of access to Russian transportation and transit infrastructure was uh, an issue of utmost importance for our sustainable economic growth, for sustaining our trade with, in the global arena. We have a uh, border with China. Of course, China is our third largest trading partner, and it's becoming one of the major investors in Kazakhstan's economy, and we have a lot of projects now being discussed. Uh, but, you know, uh, say for Eurasian Economic Union, it's a decision made by the establishment of Kazakhstan based on very pragmatic reasons. We need to have a smooth access for, access 
for both transit, uh, for, uh, for imports and exports to Russian transportation infrastructure. And this is one of the major components of the Eurasian Economic Union Agreement, which has started its enactment as of 1st January, January 2015. And therefore, to say that because of, of course, uh, you know, with the currency devaluation in Russia, uh, most of the Kazakhstani consumers are now benefiting from cheap prices or for, uh, for uh, apartments, for uh, real estate, for, uh, for automobiles, and for food products. Of course, it's a challenge for our producers now. And uh, we are also adjusting our uh, economic uh, uh, you know, policies, taking into account these implications. But we believe that this is a temporary implications and uh, of, of the current uh, uh, events which are taking place in the Russian economy. And uh, we are not being affected by embargo directly because as I have mentioned, we have a strong relationship with globally with our major key trading partners. And we are working closely with Russia in order to make sure that Ukrainian goods are transited through Russia to Kazakhstan without any interruptions. And uh, with Ukraine, we have a strong both political and economic relationship and which uh, we hope and we are working hard will not be affected by uh, the current circumstances and by, by the current situation. So Russia is our strategic partner. It's our neighbor. And we used to be mo more than 40% of population of Kazakhstan are Russian speaking. And uh, uh, we are part of the same cultural uh, common uh, space or framework. So therefore, I think that, uh, you know, there are, of course, temporary economic effects on certain groups of producers or on certain economic uh, entities. But in the long run and in general, uh, I don't think that the uh, value, how you have mentioned Professor Hausman. Professor Hausman was my professor at Harvard University. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not affecting, uh, it's not going to be devalued by the current situation. Thank you. Mr. Deripaska, can you, I, I know you do not represent the Russian government, uh, but can you, can you very briefly yeah. react to Professor Hausmann's question? Yeah, but I, I can answer for Mother Russia, but I will not hesitate to, you know, to forward my view. First of all, Eurasian Union was you know, President Nazarbayev's idea, and I think it was very you know, thoughtful and right idea. And, and, President Nazarbayev has very clear view how Eurasia should you know, de be developed, transformed, and uh, I think it's very important. And it's, it's a mutual benefit for, you know, you know, for many reasons, not just transportation, logistic, you know, but it's common market. You know, and, uh, for reform, you know, we need to adjust culture. Culture first, reform you know, would be successful, you know, second. And uh, yes, there is a challenge. Russia will suffer. You know, you know, unfortunately, it will have no consequence, but uh, in two, three years, I think we will make a proper, you know, uh, outcome out of this, what's happened, and uh, we can, you know, go further. This is the only hope, and, you know, we suffer a lot, you know, for the last 300 years, but always, you know, slowly come back. We have five minutes left, so one minute for you in the back, and I believe there's somebody behind me. That's another 30 seconds, and then to everyone at the panel, I apologize. Thank you. I'll be very, uh, uh, very uh, quickly. Um, a question for China. Uh, I'm wondering if any panelists want to comment on the uh, reviving Silk Road project or reviving Silk Road uh, uh, strategy. To what extent and uh, in what way can this strategy contribute to the region? Thank you. <coughs> Sir, you have a microphone. Yes. Okay. Uh, the question is if you think that the situation with oil prices will push the countries to, into financing alternative energy resources into financing this sphere. That's All right. It. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to the panel. I'll start with you, Jose Manuel. Yeah. Uh, no, I think about the, this concrete question. Minute, it's better minute. that the, the, per, the, peop, the representatives of the country say what they think. I just want to make a general comment, if I may, following all the very interesting discussion. And I thank you all for the comments. Is this about Eurasian Union yes. and European Union? Because that's a very sensitive issue. It's true that this tragedy, and the word was commonly used, of a Ukrainian crisis, um, 
is now a major obstacle for um, good confidence relations between Europe and Russia, and this is having a profound impact. And so it may affect also the overall relation. But I also believe that establishing a proper relationship between the Eurasian Union and the European Union could be a way out of the, for the solution for the Ukrainian issue. It's one of the scenarios that uh, at least I was studying when I was still Commission President. So trying to find a solution, not just in terms of the conflict Ukraine-Russia, but what could be the good relationship between Eurasian Union and the European Union with one principle that is very important. That's why I made this remark in my introductory remark, the respect of the sovereignty of all the members of the different unions. This is the question. Because if not, then we have a problem. <laughs> so we have to, but if you accept, like in the European Union, that countries are free to be members or free to leave, that, uh, and that we should accept the same principle in the other uh, union, and of course, that each country there should respect, of course, the borders and the stability of the others. And this is part, because one point I just want to clarify, and I finish, European as such did not impose any kind of partnership to any country. For instance, Armenia decided, we know why, decided not to, 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 to make the agreement cooperation with, with the European Union, and the European Union okay, accepted it perfectly well. So, but Ukraine wanted to have an agreement with the European Union, and we accepted that. So this is the important principle, the respect of the sovereignty of all the members. If this principle is accepted, I think it's probably too idealistic now, but I believe it's feasible to work in the future between Ukraine, Russia, and European Union for a solution of the Ukrainian issue, also having in mind the for, for longer-term perspective for this cooperation. Thank you, Jose Maribel, and apologies for trying to, no, no. <coughs> to direct you. Uh, Mr. Shakhtubat. Uh, well, just quickly on the two questions. Uh, very, very brief. Please, yeah. yeah, reviving Silk Road, yes, it is uh, should be part, absolutely part of the rejuvenation of this whole region. It goes to Oleg's point about infrastructure, fundamentally, but it also goes to investments by China in many of these countries, and I think that's very, very important. Yeah. Secondly, it's on alternative energy sources, Yes, there is a push now on renewables, but we're in the foothills, frankly, of thinking about renewables in this region. So we've just had our first major uh, wind farm project in Kazakhstan, whereas we've been doing so many of these in other countries already. So we now need to do a lot more of that. Thank you. Mr. Dear Pasca, any closing uh, Renewables would seconds? be under pressure, but we need to improve environment and, uh, again, infrastructure. You can't put renewables with, with, without proper grid interconnection because renewables yeah. very vulnerable you know in a day yeah. you know, yeah. in a, in a season you know, and uh, you need to have proper power grid which should connect in you know, a whole Eurasia you know, and proper capacity man because this will bring a lot of efficiency and Silk Road it's, it's very important project and uh, the faster Silk Road so Silk Road will will, you know, will will go the more understanding you know how it's to plan you know cross-country yeah. infrastructure and how it will cost and what sort of benefits. It's, it's a very interesting project. It must be supported. And Thank you. A brief comment from you. On Silk good. Road, I would like to mention that Kazakhstan has launched a mega road transportation project, which is called Western China, Eastern Europe. And uh, it's uh, a project which is financed both by Kazakhstan's government uh, as well as Russian government on its territory and uh, Chinese government on the Chinese part. This project is uh, uh, called to or is aimed at boosting trade, not only uh, between Europe and China, but also in the broad re Eurasian region and within Central Asian region too. And we are also working on building the infrastructure for the special economic zone Horgos on the border with China. And as I have mentioned, China is becoming uh, gradually one of the major investors, not only into the uh, oil energy sector of Kazakhstan, but also contributing to diversification of Kazakhstan's growth. Yesterday, my prime minister has discussed with Chinese prime minister uh, at the meeting uh, projects for 
which will be outside extracting sectors and in services sectors. And uh, we are discussing the projects for almost like 20 billion US dollars joint uh, mm -hmm. ventures between Chinese and Kazakhstan's companies. And uh, uh, regarding the renewables, I, using this opportunity, I just would like to invite all your governments and representatives to the Expo 2017, which will take place in Astana. And uh, the theme of the Expo is new uh, energy, and where Kazakhstan is particularly, I think, it is important in current uh, global prices, volatile price situation for uh, our exports of crude oil and other energy resources. Uh, we are uh, now looking at uh, alternative energy sources and development of this segment as uh, one of the uh, ways for ensuring sustainable economic growth. Thank, Thank you, you, Minister. Uh, final minute for you, President. Uh, of course, I support renewables, and we do uh, projects on that. Of course, Silk Road is uh, for us a strategic importance, but I would like maybe to draw attention to what Mr. Barroso said about the respect to the choices. And this is the most important, especially for the countries which had uh, the history, not an easy one. And as um, we discussed prior, independence of Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and our partners is only less for 25 years. And therefore, for us, uh, being able to make a choice and to analyze the situation is very important. And any kind of integration is uh, just a reflection of your agenda. Uh, you integrate because you want to have more protection or you want to have more economic advantages or you have to have more bilateral, trilateral cooperation. Therefore, uh, the way how uh, European Union treats uh, its program of association, Eastern Partnership, I think is a very good example. It gives you the choice, it gives you a criteria, it gives you opportunity and you choose. You want to be here or you want to be there or you don't want to be anywhere. And then you discuss it in your country and make a right choice. So I think this is the best uh, example how to integrate. Because you cannot integrate by force. We already had it. And our nations know what is to be integrated by force and to vote for 100%. You know, uh, so this form of cooperation, I think, is the best. And as I said, want to repeat with the European Union, we want to be as close as European Union can afford us to be close. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very rich and candid conversation, which could have lasted much longer. Thank you. Thank you, Minister.